Welcome back to the final episode of our Skyjack series, everyone. We had a lot of fun with this series, and we hope you've enjoyed it so far, too. If you're enjoying this interesting and rich world, please consider listening to, and then backing on Kickstarter, Courier's Call. They met their funding goal on the first day of the Kickstarter, and are now working towards some exciting stretch goals. If you love podcasts that you can listen to with your whole family, such as this one, mm-hmm. please check it out and consider making a full season a reality. Yeah, it's really good. It's really I, good. I actually listened to the whole thing, and I'm excited for the episode six that came out recently. Oh, so I we're still on episode five, and Nate was really upset because it only takes 15 minutes to drive to his dad's house, and he's like, it's uh-huh. going to take a month to finish every episode. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we don't have anywhere to go right now. <laughs> exactly. Well, another great thing that you can do with your time is head on over to Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or any number of other places and leave us a review. Uh, You can do so like Scott Paladin did on Podchaser. And Scott said, Character Creation Cast is for RPGs like eating just the delicious cream out of an Oreo. The process is so pleasant, and they get to dive into a game and show the best parts. Let's make some people! I like, I like the it. idea of being the cream in an Oreo. Being the cream in the Oreo, it's 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 a very good compliment. It is. Well, aren't you just the cream in the Oreo? <laughs> I like it. I like it too. How many other sayings can we make up on this podcast? I don't know. We didn't make that well, one up though. Scott did. So. I guess that's true. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Scott. Scott, for your contribution. <laughs> <laughs> well, with all of that out of the way, uh, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. discussion episode. Last time we created characters for Genesis. This episode we'll be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back James D'Amato. Do you want to go ahead and reintroduce yourself again for everyone at home and tell us about the character you made in our last episode? Uh, Yes, I am James D'Amato, president of the One Shot Network, host of One Shot and Campaign. And last episode, I made a character called Old Song who is a member of the Liquid Swords Monastery, or used to be some time ago, because they are currently dead and a ghost. (laughs) Um, Old song, uh, I believe, I mean, in in my head, probably follows around Ryan's character uh, Mm -hmm. as Ryan's sort of on this, like, very important journey that maybe could be about revenge, uh, maybe could just be about some other form of justice, uh, and I'm there to lend some of the wisdom of the Liquid Swords Monastery and prevent disaster. Mm-hmm. And Amelia, can you tell us about your character? Sure. I made Eudora Atherton, who is um, a very ambitious aristocrat and also a necromancer, maybe, in her spare time. We should dig down <laughs> on that and figure oh, out what's I'm going on Oh, I'm very excited to figure out exactly why I'm a necromancer. I'm <laughs> so excited to hear about this. Um, Ryan, do you want to tell us about your character? Yeah, so I made Ezra Fallen Star. Uh, she is a fallen angel uh, and a liquid sword traveler. Uh, they use she, they pronouns. Um, and yeah, she was somebody that uh, used to be an angel for an indeterminate amount of time, and uh, something caused her to fall to earth and lose her wings. And now they are trying to uh, exist in this world, uh, learned what they could from the Liquid Sword Monastery, um, and now they have the ability and the the power to uh finally make right what was once made wrong all right let's go ahead and dive into our segment that we call d20 for your thoughts d20 for your thoughts (laughs) 
And I hate it every time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process of the game we just created characters for uh, and how it relates to this system and to other games. Um, but first. Our get to know you questions. Yeah. Uh, James, we've already talked to you about how you started playing games and started podcasting, but I want to talk about this setting in particular. Um, why is this the direction that you chose to take campaign and what has the process of creating this world looked like for you? Uh, so we chose this really because uh, Johnny and JPC wanted to play as sky pirates i mean they didn't even know they wanted to play as sky pirates initially they just the idea they came up with was sky pirates they didn't know who would be gming it um they didn't even really know that it would be uh part of the campaign thing or if it would be their own thing um so they came to me with that idea and uh i thought about sky pirates and like what I thought would be compelling about it. Um, I tried to avoid steampunk uh, in creating this setting. A, a big portion of that is steampunk is a genre that's kind of loaded uh, with its own fans and genre conventions and whatnot. And I feel like I don't know a lot about it. So yeah. I tried to like develop something that is distinct. And what I think of as Skyjacks is folktale punk. It mm. is us taking uh, folk tales and the idea of folk beliefs and superstitions and using that to create a framework for a universe. Um, and we're still using the punk aspect of punk in this is a story about uh, people resisting oppression and oppressors. Um one of the things that we wanted to do with this is try our best at telling an anti-colonialist uh, story. Um, mm. You know, being from the U.S., uh, pretty much everything in my life and cultural experience has been shaped or touched in some way by colonialism. Uh, and it's kind of a, a, a bad, toxic thing. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. not even kind of. It is a bad, toxic thing yeah. that, that's hurt <laughs> lots of people um, over a very long period of time. And, you know, I cannot overthrow colonialism uh, as, as much as I uh, have a distaste for things that uh, happened because of colonialism and things that continue to happen. Uh, there's only so much that I can personally do to resist it. And I'm kind of obligated to a lot of institutions that depend on colonialist assumptions. So my way of, of pushing back against that is trying to tell a story that resists that framework as much as possible. Um, and in Campaign Skyjacks, I wanted our overall campaign to be about overcoming a colonial oppressor and imagining what the world could be like without that uh, sort of limitation on it. Um, mm. And I like I, I think that went hand in hand with the Decemberists because in their myriad songs about sad sailors, uh, they're usually about people who are the victims of oppressive systems or the victims of outright oppressive people. Um, people who are the victims of oppressive circumstances. Um, and I, I think that thematically blended very well uh, to sort of undermining colonialism and capitalism. Uh, then the adventure fiction coming in, that is, you know, the, the base set of the universe is like there is oppression, there is uh, strife and suffering and, finding ways around that and overcoming that and building new things is where we find adventure fiction. Um, and so a lot of the world building process has been about pulling mythology out of songs and folk tales and folk beliefs and uh, trying to build a universe out of that. Uh, there's also the the straight up acknowledgement that there's only so much a person in my position can really do to tell an anti-colonial narrative. Because as I pointed out, 
uh, it's shaped every aspect of my life uh, mm-hmm. and and the culture that I come from. So I've uh, also hired freelancers to try and fill in some cultural gaps. And I, I don't know that we'll be successful. Uh, you know, we might look back at this in a few years and find that like, oh, well, you know, we tried our best, but uh, there were some things that didn't work out. Hopefully we inspire, uh, you know, a generation of creatives who can take what we did and build on it and expand on it and, you know, make our efforts appear foolish and, uh, you know, <laughs> infantile in, in their <laughs> ability to actually achieve what they were seeking to achieve. Mm-hmm. So here's a question that I always love hearing the answer to uh, from our guests. Uh, can you tell us about your personal process for picking and creating a character in, in pretty much any role-playing system? Huh. Um, a lot of it is improvisational. Um, at this point, I have to create characters in so many different games that I don't really have the luxury to sit around and think about, ooh, this is a character that I want to be, or this is a character that I want to make. Uh, because if I get caught up in that, you know, it's like, well, I don't really have a desire to do that so much as I just want to play this game. So I will typically either base characters around characters that other people have brought to the table um, and sort of let them evolve based on other player choices to kind of support the themes and ideas that they're bringing forward. Uh, Or I will use something like the luminary divinations uh, that I used for us at the outset to create uh, a framework that I can build upon. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I love how everybody's answer is so super different to this question. (laughs) (laughs) How do you think character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that you've played? You've played a lot of games and made a lot of characters. So how do you feel like this went compared to other things that you've done? I'd put it pretty squarely in the middle. I mean, Mm. Genesis is a crunchy system. Like it, or it has crunchy aspects. Uh, Mm -hmm. So you can spend a very long time making a character in a crunchy game. I think, especially if you use a tool like Genesis Emporium, it tends to go pretty quickly. If we were doing this by hand, just the arithmetic would stretch it out much longer than (laughs) it needs to be. But Mm -hmm. having that supplemental tool really uh, makes it a, a much a much more tolerable process for me, which I, is not a charitable term, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like I, I think it does allow you to build a pretty specific vision. I think for a lot of players, they're going to want more experience. Uh, but you know, I, I tend to start making characters at higher levels in a lot of games that I play anyway, just because I think it's more interesting to have more abilities. Um, mm-hmm. I think o- overall the, the character creation process is not as arduous as it could be, but it's also not like a powered by the apocalypse game or or a forged in the dark game, one mm. where as you build characters, the system helps you establish connection between players and characters which I think leads to a stronger experience. Um, Also, you know, world building is kind of divorced from what we're doing here, which makes it, in my mind, less compelling. I I look at something like A Descent into Midnight, where Mm -hmm. world building is inextricably linked to what you're doing when you create characters. Uh, So, you know, this is middle of the road. It's not the worst crunchy system. Uh, It might be among the best sort of traditional uh, systems, but like still, I I think there are games out there that now really could be said to be defining the traditional space that are Mm -hmm. doing really interesting things with character Mm -hmm. creation. And like, if I wasn't on character creation cast, if I was doing a one-shot episode, I probably wouldn't broadcast the creation of these characters just because I don't think it's that interesting to listen to. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it does fall squarely in the middle of that crunchy thing because any I f- anything that has XP spends is always a little too crunchy for me. I like playing the game of Genesis, but creating characters is not one of my biggest 
excitement. Mm -hmm. Um, I do like that it feels easy enough to spend those points though that like it's i feel like it's very clear what you can do with your points and Mm -hmm. it's not you know there are only three derived attributes so yeah (laughs) it's okay and it might be uh it might be the tool that we use this time uh compared to the tool last time with star wars but it, it felt like it was a little easier than star wars um i had less of a compulsion to uh, try and min max completely. Mm. Or one. maybe that's an early episode and you've grown as a person. I mean, that's very possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that is extremely possible. Uh, but yeah, the, it was it was really easy, especially with the tool, um, and it it went faster than I was anticipating. Uh, you know for... what I think would be interesting yeah. is to take it at some point and do it as a true genre neutral game and then try and make our characters go together and see what happens what kind of setting comes out of that that would be an interesting exercise with genesis uh create the characters first and then see what sort of setting comes out of that yeah start with anything in the base book but that that sounds like an undertaking <laughs> yeah. yes yeah another time <laughs> awesome the mechanics of character creation in Genesis does it does it reinforce the feel of actually playing the game? I don't think so. I mean, no, it feels very divorced from it. Yeah, you're you're just you're just setting up the the dominoes. You know, you're 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 not really doing anything. There, there's no play in the character creation mm-hmm. in in the traditional sense. I mean. I am a big proponent of finding personal play in game systems. And, you know, there are definitely people who enjoy the process of creating a character in a crunchy game that has a really resplendent level of details that you can pick and choose from as you uh, create, like, you, your person. Um, but there, it, it doesn't reflect what the game is actually doing. Yeah, it... I think the closest thing that it has is uh, experience points is going to tell you kind of you're going to be working with experience probably through play. But uh, that's that's kind of the, the only thing that even remotely feels like it would come up in actual play. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's attached to it at all. It feels like a very separate thing happening mm-hmm. over here and then you go play the game. Yeah, um, as opposed to like being an intro to the game, which is usually the ones that we we get excited about, is when mm-hmm. it really tells you what playing the game is going to be like. And I don't think that this really does a good job of that. Having yeah. played the game, it feels totally separate. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That that kind of leads me to um, another question uh, about the the biggest flaw of character creation in this system. Um, I kind of have a thought in mind, but what what do you think, James? What do you think is the biggest flaw? of character creation in the, in Genesis. Huh? I mean, you know, I don't know that there's anything that I would classify as a flaw per se. Uh, you know, going from kind of the Roger Ebert school of, uh, judging a thing. Um, you're, you're judging it based on what it was trying to achieve. Right. And Mm -hmm. this is a crunchy game that is trying to give you the tools that you need to play it in character creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think it does a fairly good job of providing you a lot of different options to allow different characters to feel distinct from one another. Um, you know, I, I, I would say, that unless you have somebody who's knowledgeable guiding you or you have personally read through the rule book as you're doing it, uh, you might not understand that uh, characteristics are as important as they are up front. Mm-hmm. Um, that really needs to be established because it's easy to build a character that has a lot of twos and feel during the game like, oh, on most of my roles, I'm underpowered. Or if mm-hmm. you thought, ooh, I'm, I really like this characteristic, but you didn't pair it with skills that you really use very frequently, uh, you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot at, at the outset. Um, it, it, like I said, that's kind of hard to call that a flaw because there's a yeah. certain level of system mastery that a game like this uh, anticipates its audience enjoying. Uh, so, you know, 
that, that I'll, I'll that, that's the closest I think I can get. Yeah, the the thing I felt was kind of missing was something that helped you figure out how your group kind of works together. So, um, I know in the Star Wars system, uh, there is uh, more to do about that, but mm -hmm. I think that might be in the strength, flaw, fear, and desire, um, mm. though those feel a lot more personally bound. Uh, it, it's not yeah. the same thing as the, uh, gosh, I'm trying to, like, the, the I, I, I know this is not the term for it, but an edge of the empire, like the debt chart or... There was something that kind of gave you uh, your motivation. It was a table that you could roll on to see what yeah. was happening this week. Um, so I, I don't know if I can truly define that because we didn't really play with that. And I've never really cared about that for mm -hmm. my process. That makes sense. What do you think are the good parts about character creation in this system? Uh, well, Amelia, did you have a flaw or did you feel? No, I just feel like for me, it's just the fact that it feels like a very separate exercise. I, mm -hmm. I like when building characters feels like playing the game. Gotcha. Gotcha. I mean, that's fair. Um, positive things. Uh, I like that. I like that you can build a starting character very quickly in a very crunchy mm -hmm. game. Even if you're doing things old fashioned way with arithmetic and by hand, if you focus on skills and characteristics, you can be done fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, that is not something that a lot of people care about, uh, but it is something that, you know, if you just want to start playing, uh, but you still want to play with a character that you made, you can do that in this system, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's hard to say that for other games. That's very true. Are there stories that you are especially interested in seeing people tell in this setting that you've created? Or stories that you're excited to tell? I mean, for certainly stories that I'm excited to tell. Um, <laughs> uh, as, as far as other people, like I try to keep my hands off of what other people might do uh, with mm -hmm. the setting um, and with the things that we created. Uh, part of it is because this is based on folk tales uh, and no one really owns those. So mm -hmm. my vision of Sphere is that there are a lot of people that tell a lot of stories on Sphere and all of them might be true in a certain mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited to see innovations that people come up with for the world, uh, see things that uh, they decide to delve into that, you know, I wouldn't have any knowledge of. And that's something that I'm kind of already getting with uh, my freelancers um, and the ideas that they're putting forward. I, I would really love to spend some time in Rakshari, uh, the place that Strix developed for us, uh, I would love to visit Windrider Island and the primary campaign at some point because there's just a lot of stuff going on there right now. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just generally excited to see people's ideas as they unfold. Nice. So this is uh, our favorite portion of the show. Uh, it's time to discuss what we think would happen with these particular characters. Uh, and we, we, we dubbed this the fanfic portion of the show. So we get to make fanfic of the characters we just made. Yeah, I'm excited because we, we did talk about determining our motivations here. And there are tables in here that we can roll on. And you know how we love random tables. <laughs> um, are you rolling so, on random tables for your motivations? I mean, I don't know. I might. Who knows what will happen? Well, I mean, One of we... the example fears is death. Well, that could be amazing. That would be amazing for a necromancer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see what happens. Well, I, I picked mine, so if you want to go ahead and roll. Okay. Uh, well, why I, don't you explain yours while I'm grabbing some dice here? Sure. So, uh, motivations. It looks like we have to pick a strength, a flaw, a desire, and a fear. So, my strength, um, there was a... a 
bunch of good ones to choose from, uh, but I went with Courageous. Because uh, I see my person as uh, somebody who likes to go uh, on the front lines and protect the people that she cares about. Um, but their flaw is anger. Um, sometimes when they are very protective um, and things aren't going their way, they might get angry. Or if... Uh, if she sees an unjust situation that uh, she wants to intervene in, um, she might get angry as well. Um, but her desire is love. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with her fear of isolation. Uh, she craves love and she fears uh, being cast out um, and isolated once again. Cool. Um, I want to point out that rolling on these random tables is doing great things for me right now. Um, <laughs> my example desire from this random table was love. Ooh. And my fear, death. So uh, Neat. Yeah, which I feel like goes along with the luminaries that we pulled before already. Oh, anyway. yeah. um, let's see here. And then for my uh, strength, I got curious. And for my flaw, I got pride. Nice. So there's um, th I, there's some I similar like, themes to Dreff there for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I feel like this is very interesting though. The idea of a necromancer who's terrified of death. Um, uh, I very to much the opposite that. of Dreff in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Although yeah. um, one might be driven to necromancy to overcome uh, a fear of death. Well, I mean, I feel like there's the potential that it's the fear of death of a loved one. Oh. Um, and be. this concern, right? Because I, I have this goal that I will pursue endlessly, um, which I think is at some point to find a lost love. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like the idea that this is a person who prepares for the worst. Um, and is like, well, there's the potential that this lost love is dead which is terrifying, and I don't want that, but I need to be able to fix it. Is your, is your lost love old song? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. How old is old song? Uh, you know, old. I didn't really define that. I, I was picturing upwards of 100 years old. Um, mm -hmm. That's amazing. You know, I'm a ghost. It can be pretty old. That's true. And that would uh, that would explain the like across any distance uh, and time your love stands eternal, uh, sort of sort of deal that we got from the luminaries, for sure. It would be that, that's really interesting because I definitely lived before Amelia. <laughs> I probably lived <gasps> oh. and died before that, <laughs> that uh -huh. character. Yes. That's true. See, that that's confusing then, though, because well, why? You could, I mean, maybe you read read my writings or poetry or something, and and fell in love with that. That might be why I'm back as a ghost too, partially. Ooh, Ooh I like that idea. Like that now, idea. now I would like you to not be a ghost. Mm -hmm. So, I am terrified of death, but in love with a ghost. Apparently, <laughs> I mean that's super neat. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. James, did you roll on tables? Did you think of anything? Um, I, I know you don't normally use these. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I don't normally use these. I can randomly select something from this drop-down menu here. Ba 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 ba. Oh nope, that's somebody else's already. So I'm just not going to do that. Uh, my strength is that I am idealistic. Uh, my flaw is recklessness. That's interesting for an old Ooh. sage. Um, that's how you died my desire is for oh no that's love i'm not gonna be right <laughs> um my desire is for expertise i'm gonna say mm. and uh my fear is expression that's really interesting um i'm gonna say this character probably kept uh anything that wasn't like that wasn't life philosophy, anything that was personal, uh, secret, 
and they like I think those are whatever writings uh, Amelia's character had that sort of sparked this infatuation or this love um, is kind of driven by that private writing. So Mm -hmm. a lot of my life, I I spent time not expressing myself and sort of probably playing into my own myth. Uh, And I achieved great things. Like I was an idealistic person. So I stuck my neck out uh, because I was also reckless, uh, but I stuck my neck out for like (laughs) good causes. Um, The thing that I really strove to achieve was like a kind of uh, personal enlightenment to reach the top of of my various fields. Um, But, you know, I did that all at the expense of interpersonal fulfillment. Hmm. I like that. I really love this. These are very good characters. So if if, um, Amelia's character, Eudora... Um, brought old San back from the dead into ghost form Mm -hmm. and old San follows Ezra uh, to give them advice and and whatnot it it would be it would be almost interesting to say like you were reading the the old uh, like entries from old San um, reading these writings were inspired, uh, did some necromantic ritual, old song comes back, but at the monastery where I'm at. And then we are somehow drawn to you mm. to get together. And then you and I don't want to be friends, but we have to be now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So what are, what are we doing on our adventures? Are we are we just going along and following your quest? Well, like, that that's a good question. What is my quest? Because um, I left it kind of generic. Of um, I'm thinking, what was wronged in my past was uh, being f- like, I don't know. Maybe maybe there was something to do with uh, I don't know. Can angels be framed by other angels? Certainly. Um, and then, yeah, uh, so sort of like revenge against somebody that that actually did something wrong, or yeah, because uh, probably the biggest injustice I can think of um, is being falsely accused of something and having nothing to do to like prove your innocence. For sure. Um, um, so, so you just suffered the punishment. So, do you have a score to settle with with some other angel out there? Is that it? Yeah, I think so. I think I have a score with some uh, devious angel that is um, not what they uh, present themselves as. Interesting. Ooh, I really like this. Yeah. So I have to. I have to kind of either um, go against them which would probably be a bad idea, uh, direct combat, you know, or um, find the truth and uh, and kind of reveal that. That could be a really interesting journey. And, like, I think, you know, m- my character, I can see them trying to push you down a different path, uh, one that is not as destructive. Um, mm-hmm. Like, yeah. That my, my main thing is being a philosophical like guidance uh, for or providing philosophical guidance for people. Um, and, you know, I have this real idealistic streak. So uh, mm-hmm. I think I would look at a, a quest for vengeance and, and try to nudge you in the direction of doing better than that. Yeah. I want to say I start out like on just pure vengeance on my mind that my anger kind of clouding my judgment and and you're able to talk me down i mean maybe i am like maybe i I think that's probably what the story is about yeah to talk talk me into thinking a little bit more um strategically and a little bit more um calmly kind of helping me find my center a little bit. 
I like it. Yeah. I would go on this adventure. Uh huh. This is. Uh, I I love these people. Yes, they're great. Very we did a great cool. job. Oh, uh-huh. We're so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we're really good at this. We're really good at this. <laughs> well, let's get into our last segment, which is our advancement discussion, and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So in this segment, we will cover character advancement and growth in this system. Um, at first, we like to say, how do uh, how do we think characters change as people within the narrative of this game? How do you mean? It, in Genesis or, or the mm-hmm. specific narrative that we've constructed? This is a hard question with a system neutral yeah. kind of game. Usually, games have like stories that they are specifically meant to tell like Mm -hmm. a specific genre of story. And so that usually leads to how people change and the kind of growth that they're meant to go through and sort of journey that they're meant to have. This game doesn't really have that. Um, You know, we've kind of made up our own story for how we think this narrative might go and what kind of growth might happen. But Genesis as a game doesn't necessarily have... It does have a framework in that you have skills and uh, characteristics and as you gain experience and talents and as you gain experience mm-hmm. points, you get more of that stuff. So mm-hmm. it is a game about you going through experiences and getting stronger because of it. Okay. So the mechanical growth kind of reinforces the the more narrative growth. I wouldn't say that. Uh, I, I like <laughs> the mechanical growth reinforces the mechanical growth. Um, okay. or, or the story growth reinforces the mechanical growth. It is, as you do things in this game, if you're playing by the rules, you will be awarded experience for doing those things, and those experience points can be used to make yourself stronger. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an interesting dichotomy in games is how you spend experience, too, and the things that you can spend it on. Um, this is the kind of game where you can go through something, you get the experience for doing that thing, and then you can spend it any way you want to. So you can spend it on something that is not narratively relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a reflection of the thing that you have just gone through. You don't say, I level up the skill because I went through this. And you certainly could. As a player, you can choose to make your mechanical choices follow that narrative pattern. But this is not a game where you have to do that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it, it's like you could uh, effectively meta your way to an like a, a min max type character if you wanted to, completely devoid of whatever story beats come at you. But why would you do that? Well, right, and because you have more fun <laughs> that way. Like I mean, literally, that's true. the reason is that you don't it's true. care about the other thing and you just uh-huh. want to do the mechanical stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so that kind of basically answers it is uh, both you grow narratively as the story progresses. Uh, it's just you don't have like that that genre framework un- until you have a setting right? that has the, the factors of the world included mm-hmm. in it. Yeah. Um, but also the the mechanics. Uh, there are mechanics for for just leveling up, and it's a point by system. So I want to ask another question. This is the question that I was going to ask before before I forgot. Um, James, do you feel like this game puts an unnecessary amount or even just a lot of pressure on the GM as opposed to the players? Or do you think that that just kind of depends on the group that you're playing with? It depends on the group. It, it really does. Like, there are some robust GM tools that, that this game has. Um, I, you know, when I think of games that put a lot of pressure on GMs, I think of games where every time you're making an opponent for your group or something, you have to fully stat out an NPC. And mm-hmm. this game does not do that to you. Uh, so... I, I think that that's a feather in its cap for sure. Um, mm-hmm. It's a mechanically robust system. So if you as a GM are really interested in the idea of doing a lot of work to prepare for sessions, uh, that option is available to you. 
Mm-hmm. Very cool. All right. Uh, did we have anything else that we wanted to go over before we wrapped I up? I don't think I do. I think awesome. I'm good. Yeah. Very cool. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Genesis. Uh, thank you both so much for having me. Uh, a lot of fun to to build characters, as always. Um, and, you know, I don't usually get to build characters as PCs in Genesis. So, you know, this was a lot of, uh, this is a fun turnaround for me. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, I really like the the group that we made and, and the the story. Uh, oh. I, I the story that it. we could be telling. That we could be telling. We do this to ourselves every time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> like, why did I just give myself goosebumps with this game? When I'm never going to be able to play it. Oh, all right. James, can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you online? Of and, course. Uh, any other things you wanted to plug last minute? Uh, best place to find me online uh, to listen to the things that I do is oneshotpodcast.com. There you can find One Shot Campaign and a host of other wonderful programs uh, that are all related to RPGs. Uh, if you want to purchase anything that I have written, you can find most of that uh, anywhere books are sold. Uh, my publisher is Adams Media, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. So Pretty much anywhere you prefer to buy your books, uh, you'll be able to find me there. Just ask for James D'Amato. Uh, then if you would like to talk to me personally, you can always head to Twitter and find me at OneShotRPG. Well, thank you again for sitting down with us, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter, at CreationCast, or on our Discord server, at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning, or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune, or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign a role-playing game. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun. It's messy, and you're invited along for the ride. Recording. The final clicky of the evening. All right, we did it. Uh, okay. Just trying to crack my back a little bit. I know, I was doing that a bunch of crackly waveforms going on. Ooh, I think you can see that on my waveforms. That's gross. <laughs> 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 I'm this very is a loud spine back. crack waveform. Yeah. yeah, I have a very loud back. <laughs> Mine's hit or miss. All right, are we ready? Yeah, let me pull that up. Okay. Okay. You should Can't consider making that your full-time voice, Ryan. I know. I tried that once for uh, our April Fools episode last year, um, and it hurt my throat after a while. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> That's a for bummer. like two minutes. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, that was like a ten-minute intro or something like that. So it's just going to be a lot of me clicking around because I can't get my settings to do what I want. Hey, did it. Oh.
name. Why do I forget that every time? We're two years into making this podcast, Ryan, and I still, every time, forget that I have to name these characters. Uh Uh-huh. That's going to be a struggle. I mean, we can always, I usually (laughs) leave names for the very end. Oh, yeah. Uh, And if you feel like any weird bit of pressure, uh, just remember that Matago essentially means werewolf. So Johnny named himself Travis Werewolf. And he's a <laughs> and he's a changeling, so you know, literally yeah. anything is legal. That's no true. one can stop you. I played an Urban Shadows game, and I was a vampire, and my name was Sanguine Tempest, which le- legitimately means blood time. So <laughs> <laughs> it's blood time. It's blood time. It's blood time, baby. <laughs> I like it. Okay, I have my book. I have this character sheet thing open. All right. The only I thing I don't have is a book, but. Well, it's okay. in here, though, isn't it? In the Emporium. Know. Is it? Oh, that's the theme. Never mind. Don't listen to me. I'll just trust everybody implicitly of what think... they say and pick from that. That's smart. Do we have it really in our smart. games? Usually I put games in here. <laughs> nope. I didn't put this one in here. Sorry. Skills kind it's of saved on my other computer. I don't that's have it fine. in here. That's fine. That's fine. You'll be okay. I'll Just be do okay. whatever we tell you. That's what I usually do anyway, and I barely ever look at the book, so uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, the majority of the time we don't have the book, so. I mean, that's very true, too. We can do it. Cool. All right. We all set? I believe I'm all, so. I'm all, I'm all done eating, so uh, all right. I'm, I'm good here. Okay. I'm going to take a drink of this soda that's really great for my throat um, real quick. It's that like That's a pro sort of tip. Right. We've, our listeners are well aware of how I feel about diet soda and Ryan's. It's diet it. soda? It's diet soda. It's diet soda. Oof. Um, yep. <laughs> Nothing but the best over here. Mm. Okay. Ryan, edit out all my typing sounds. Well, I mean, there's a lot of dead air to edit out, so. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Um, Darling? Could you get me a, a water, a fizzy water? Sorry, I've just been talking a lot today. That happens. Like it's your job. <laughs> fizzy water. Yeah, baby. San Pellegrino. Mm. My kids are um, plodding on the ground above my head right now which are making some very fantastic waveforms, so I apologize if you hear some thudding in your ears. (laughs) There was a puppy barking downstairs before. I'm hoping that didn't end up in there. 